As we've all likely been revisiting recently through Season 4 of Attack on Titan's anime adaptation, the Mali arc is conceptually remarkable on several levels, but its defining bragging right thematically is its perspective shift. Chapter 91 is set in a different world to Chapter 90 of Attack on Titan. Suddenly we're thrust into an unfamiliar war with new characters with our only connectors to our previous story, and cast being our former antagonists, Reiner and Zeke, who we will shortly learn we mistook as our villains. The narrative by engaging us in this perspective shift is obviously trying to say something thematically, and it's with the Mali arc that we first truly realise that Attack on Titan is an exercise in perspective. For the first 90 chapters of the series we were presented with our Paradisian characters' perspectives and followed them almost blindly as they fought off extinction and overthrew oppressive governments. Citation needed. But now, through the Mali arc, we are slowly being forced to empathise with the other side. A side in which we couldn't even conceive of a relatable or justifiable motivation for, just a few chapters beforehand. Even after the basement reveal and the explanation of the warrior program, they were just misguided fools, right? They were victims doing awful things. But as we grew to love Reiner, Piek, Magath, Falco, and of course Gabby, we begin to empathise. And then we get recontextualization from Reiner, Annie, and Bertolt's perspective on how the series started. And then we begin to understand them and their motivations. And then Reiner gets an endorsement from Eren, relieving him from culpability as he was just trying to save the world. And we finally realise, through the narrative telegraphing it to us, in every conceivable way, that we were wrong. We had been drip-fed information by the narrative in a way to skew our perspectives in favour of one side and view the other as monsters. Out of ignorance we didn't even consider the other perspective, and retroactively we now look like ignorant fools. We were wrong. Attack on Titan has been playing with us from the very beginning and now is waving our seemingly obvious ignorance back in our faces. How could we have never considered this other perspective? It seems so obvious to us in retrospect. But therein lies what the narrative is trying to say. There are two sides to every story. From everyone's perspective, they view themselves as the hero of this story. Attack on Titan is telling us that until we recognise this in each other and attempt to understand one another, both sides thinking themselves righteous and the other evil will continue justifying killing each other and the cycle will repeat endlessly. It's not a revolutionary theme, but it's a poignant and always relevant one because humanity evidently still hasn't learned. That's the point, and the perspective shift is the first step in truly tackling that theme. The first 90 chapters were set up and the Alliance realises this theme, and seeks to fight for it in its climactic battle against Eren. But with perspective as a theme in Attack on Titan having now been established, let's talk about one part of this theme in greater detail. I want to talk about personal perspective and recognising your own former ignorance through recontextualization. Looking back on one's personal perspective and what one once believed can be a valuable teaching experience, an attack on Titan under the umbrella of its perspective theming forces the audience and its Paradisian protagonists to confront this past ignorance in a teaching moment in variety throughout the series, which is basically the narrative flexing its structural brilliance on us. It's basically throwing your old beliefs back in your face in this new context and putting a mirror up to you so you can have the realisation of how ignorant you once were. These core themes and ideas have changed with context and time, which is what I want to talk about in this video in case you neglected the title. I want to present how the narrative once presented an idea or theme, and show how how it is presented changed over time, when the audience and the characters have become less ignorant, and how that reinforces this theme of perspective by depicting these things from a different angle. Let's start with an example regarding Historia, everybody's favourite neglected mother. Historia calling herself the worst girl in the world was originally something Historia says, realising Ymir's ambition for her. Ymir wants Historia to live her own life by her own terms, living for herself, something Ymir could never do as the most selfless girl in the world. This ran contrary to what Historia had been taught her entire life, as, as a little girl, she was told by Frida to try and emulate this girl in some story she had read from 2000 years ago, a girl that happened to also be called Ymir. But in this moment, Historia stands as an individual, not defined by those around her, and rejects the selfless option of eating her friend and reclaiming the founder's power the power she's been led to believe could save everybody inside the walls and chooses to not take that burden, and saves Eren calling herself the worst girl in the world, who may have just sacrificed everything for what she personally wanted. 
Now this moment when it happened originally is a triumphant one for the audience. She's rejecting her manipulative father and saving Eren, our favourite boy. To us she is doing the right thing, and her calling herself the worst girl in the world is viewed as almost sarcastic by the audience, reflecting her bombastic behaviour in that scene. The worst girl in the world was one of our favourites, and not somebody to be afraid of or checked. But when this label is implicated again in chapter 130 of Attack on Titan and Historia again sides with Eren over what could be the more righteous option, and he reminds her that she is the worst girl in the world, it's not so sarcastic anymore. Historia by implication in this flashback signs off on the rumbling plan, making her partially responsible for the deaths of potentially billions of people, and the terror that we have seen play out in these recent chapters. Through this she's become the worst girl in the world, or perhaps as Eren implies in chapter 130 30, she actually was the worst girl in the world when she originally saved Eren, because she saved Eren that day. If she had just eaten Eren and had been consumed by the first king of the wall's will, would billions of people be dying in the rumbling? She could have killed the biggest mass murderer in the history of humanity back then, but she saved him and seemingly endorsed his rumbling plan. She's ended up sided with the very girl whose stories she rejected from 2000 years ago. With time and more context, the same actions that we once sided with from our perspective we now struggle against from our perspective. We were stupid and naive to ever believe that siding with the worst girl in the world was ever a good decision, and only in our current context can we understand how damaging that can be. And the narrative by implicating that phrase that we appreciated back then is waving our former ignorance in our faces. We never properly considered what that meant. For another example of core themes changing with context, let's journey back to the distant past of Chapter 2 of Attack on Titan when Eren proclaims with Reiner auspicious featured in the background that he will ambiguously kill every last one of them. Now at the time, and in that context, this line would seemingly reference killing every last titan, as Eren is reeling from the death of his mother earlier in the chapter and refuses to succumb to the dread of being at the titan's mercy, so instead he flips to the other extreme to fight and to kill them all. This line at the time is something we feel and can get behind. These titans are monstrous killing machines with no humanity, easy idols for our hatred and lust for revenge. We are strongly positioned behind Eren and his ambition here, and we just experienced his mother's death alongside him. However, as we had gradually learned, maybe these monsters didn't deserve our hatred, but our pity. And maybe ambitiously killing to killing every last one of them isn't a healthy proclamation to make. If that line is revisited in the current Attack on Titan context, and in the current context of Eren's character, the genocidal cracks in this proclamation are all too obvious. Eren is currently a monstrous titan in his own right, commanding an army of colossal titans killing every last person from the other side of the ocean. And whereas originally we were entirely down with eradicating the titan threat, the rumbling and killing billions of people we aren't entirely down for. This fundamental change in how we view this phrase, I'll kill every last one of them, more than just being a neat bit of foreshadowing, reinforces this theme we've been talking about all video. It highlights our original ignorance and teaches us, in remembering our former personal perspective, not to blindly call for the deaths of an enemy we don't understand. Perhaps killing every last one of them is never a good idea or something that should be romanticised. We didn't understand, and Eren didn't understand, what was happening back in Chapter 2. We both still had so much to learn, and maybe in looking forward to future problems, we shouldn't make this same mistake. The narrative to telegraph this point reintroduces the idea and in a different context to highlight and wave in our faces how ignorant we once were in order for us to learn from it. The final major example I want to delve into in this video of this phenomena is the nationalistic undertones or maybe overtones of early Attack on Titan. The salute from Attack on Titan is nearly as ubiquitous as the Titans themselves to the identity of the series, and that along with the pounding anthemic marching songs that opened each episode of its anime, as well as the general pride the characters had in saving humanity and battling back the Titans in early Attack on Titan, made Attack on Titan seem like a nationalist wet dream. Now nationalism as we know is stupid and pretty immoral, but this was not seen as overly problematic early on, because the nationalism wasn't really nationalism, because it was pride for humanity in a fight for survival, at least we thought. It wasn't bolstering one people over another. So many looked the other way, but as the narrative developed and we learnt that humanity's survival was not what our characters had been fighting for all along, and that their fight was mainly in their own interest as a potential empire, the accusations of the problematic nationalistic and fascistic trappings of the series started to get more traction. Things had changed. Now it was about cheering for one people against another, leading to some outrightly declaring Attack on Titan fascist. 
The problem for the people making this claim is that this was an example of what we've been talking about all video. Nationalism is a core theme of the series that's changed with context, as does the audience's and the characters' opinions on it. The scouts' pride in themselves and their corresponding salute used to be emulated by the audience as it was seemingly justified while our characters were fighting the Titan threat. But as things begin to change, the characters doing the salutes and reiterating these nationalistic trappings changed as well, causing reflection in the audience and in the characters. This is most on display in Chapter 110, when Zachary is assassinated when a bomb goes off in his favourite torture chair, killing him and sending him flying out of his window in full view of a crowd protesting outside his gates demanding the release of the currently imprisoned Eren Jaeger. After this act of political violence, the crowd goes up in uproarious adulation, saluting and calling for all to dedicate their hearts in the restoration of the Eldian Empire, the most destructive and violent empire in history, that these morons had no idea they were even descendants of five years ago. Yet already the nationalistic poison of racial identity is sunken in, and our characters who are witness to this event, Mikasa, Armin, and Hitch, all watch on in awe, as something they used to have pride in, and used to mean something good, is bastardized by this fear-mongering group of actual fascists. That salute used to be about saving humanity, and now it's being appropriated by people who seek to destroy humanity. A core theme of Attack on Titan has changed meaning in this new context, allowing for the characters and the audience to realise the dangers of these nationalistic trappings that they once used to their advantage. Adding to this, the only characters post time skip who continue to show the same pride in their cause that the Paradisians once showed in humanity are the Jaegerus faction. The supposed followers of Eren, led mostly notably by Flock, and these guys are despicable. They are outright fascists. They are not to be admired, and if Flock's continual humiliation wasn't enough to get this across, obviously they are being negatively portrayed and not endorsed by the narrative. They believe in racial superiority, and again have pride in heritage that they were blind to only a few years ago, that is now intrinsically apparently tied to their identity. They execute and assassinate their political opponents, as they were the ones who assassinated Zackley, and even take over the military through insurrection. The narrative is not glorifying this. The messages about perspective the series is trying to impart directly contradicts them and is ignored by them. They don't try and understand the other perspective, and they think they are just as justified now in wanting to kill all those who would encroach on the Eldian Empire as they were when they thought they were fighting Titans. After all, isn't that what hypernationalism does? Dehumanizes the enemy? Makes you feel like you're saving humanity while taking them out? When in actuality the things on the other side are just the same as you? Perhaps mindless pride in your side of the conflict without understanding the other side is stupid and something we should avoid, and we should never again assume no matter how monstrous the enemy seems to us that they are not human. Again this is another example of the narrative waving our previous behaviour in our faces, making us reflect on our ignorant past actions, endorsing this kind of nationalistic thinking because it can never be justified. Also Attack on Titan is not fascist, in case that was not clear. I think by now my point is incredibly clear, and the narrative structurally facilitating this type of thematic consistency and exploration of perspective, not only the perspective of others but your former self speaks for itself. It's an incredibly impressive feat and something incredibly interesting to think about. Even Eren, our protagonist for the first 90 chapters of the manga, is with a change in time and context fundamentally viewed differently by the audience and our characters. And this is, in turn, some cause for reflection. We neglected to ever properly process what this little shit was capable of. He did kill those kidnappers when he was extremely young, and he did promise to kill them all when he was only a year older. And we ignored this behaviour and these warning signs, siding with him out of ignorance. And now, we as the audience and the characters around him are paying for it. He's now our antagonist. This stuff is not only fascinating, but it also allows you to reflect on how much you've progressed and changed along with these characters throughout the story, while also being thematically poignant. With a change in perspective, with a different context and a different moment in time, people can see things from wildly different angles and come away with wildly different interpretations of what it is that is happening and whether or not it is good or bad. The rumbling to the people in Paradise is safety, the rest of the world can't harm them now, but to the rest of the world or anybody that values the livelihoods of their fellow man and isn't an entirely self-interested Paradisian, it's literally an unimaginable crime against humanity. Everybody has a perspective, and understanding each other can only lead to 
cooperation and better solutions to our mutual problems. Thematically, Attack on Titan is about understanding each other and being better to each other through understanding. Even if it seems like your contexts are so removed from each other that you couldn't possibly understand each other, you can learn. Just think about how much you've changed personally on the topics and things we've talked about in this very video. And with this added personal perspective, hopefully we can work through our problems. After all, we haven't even tried to talk this out yet.